Good morning again, Rockfish Church. It's, it's an honor to be with you today. Boy, they've changed the lights since the last time I was here, it seems like, because I can't see anybody. This feels more like Rayford now. There we go. Now, hey, there everybody is. Again, for those that may not know me, my name is Clay. I am the Director of Outreach with Rockfish Church, and we're here for week three of our ser- sermon series, Glow, where the dark meets the light. And we talked about in the first week, we laid out pretty much the state of where thing, where we are. If you were here or at one of our campuses, you, saw so, you heard some shocking statistics and numbers, uh, like only 19% of, of professing Christians actually have a truly biblical worldview. I ran across another one last week as I was preparing some stuff that, that 70, 72% of Americans believe there's a heaven, but only 54 54 or 58, I don't remember off the top, believe that, that hell is a real place. And that, that, that kind of fits with our culture and this, this, this idea that we've wanted to put God into this box, that God is a loving God, and so a, a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. Of course, the reality of it is, is, is our loving God doesn't send people to hell. He offers us a choice. Choices have consequences. I think it was Moses that said it, I set before you this day, life and death. I, I urge you to choose life. We're given a choice. And that's where we're going to kind of pick up last week. We talked about the corporate role of the church, the, the, what some call the capital C church, or even the lower C church in this, this local body. We have a responsibility as a local body. Today we're going to talk about, we're going to take it to the next step, and this is a concept that has been lost in our culture. It's not very popular, but it's individual responsibility. You know, it started many years ago with this idea that you're not responsible for your own actions, or you're not responsible for your own outcomes. Uh, if, if you do bad things, well then it, it, it can be we can now blame that on, well, I was abused as a child or my, my parents mistreated me. And those things happen and they do cause issues, but ultimately we hit a point in life where we're an adult now and we become responsible for what we do. And it, it's interesting, just on a side note, if you stop and think about the, 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 the logical path of where this idea of we're not responsible for our own, even our own outcomes in life, that I have the things I have and the privilege, privileges I have because society afforded them to me, guys, that's, that's socialism. That's communism. When you, when you truly follow it to its logical end. So we have to be careful that we don't adopt that mentality in the church. We have an individual responsibility. And, and, and this next slide, this, this picture is probably a scene that looks very familiar to some of you. you you've either seen it or you've been a part of it. And, and as I look at this, I, to be honest, I never served in the military. I have four sons that did, but I never had that honor myself. I have extreme respect for those that do. But you see them standing in formation, and we can't tell how many people are there just, just by looking at the picture. And there's, there's very little individuality in this picture. They're all one unit. And I've talked to people in the military. I've talked to, to um, drill instructors or drill sergeants or, uh, you know, master chiefs in the Navy. Uh, I apologize to the Army guys. I'll tell you right now, if I try to talk much Navy or much military jargon, it will be Navy stuff because... I had two sons that went in the Army and two sons that went in the Navy, but the one that went in first went in the Navy. So I learned all the Navy terms. So if I, if, if I, if I throw one out like A school instead of AIT, it's not because I favor one over the other. Uh, it's just that that's how I learned it. But even the two guys that have separated themselves from the rest of the group, one of them looks just like the rest of them standing in the exact same position. And I think sometimes we feel like we've separated ourselves from the world, but we look just like them. One guy stands out in that picture that's different from all the others. 
That's the guy holding the flag. And see, that's what we're supposed to do in this, in this world. We're supposed to carry the banner of Jesus Christ into hostile enemy territory. We can't do that as long as we want to stand in formation with everybody else and be like the rest of the crowd. We have to be willing to be different, and it's an individual responsibility. So we're going to take a look. We're going to take real quickly, we're going to go through a few things, kind of examine where we might be in our faith, and then we're going to jump into a list of do's and don'ts. I don't really like to break anything down into a list of of, of stop doing this and start doing that, but it just fits and works with this with this sermon series. And this is, we're building to something in case you haven't caught that, and I would encourage you, don't miss next week. Next week is going to be huge. We're launching two different initiatives, kind of what we're building to, going to put some stuff in your hands to make this, this, this mission, this idea of making the Great Commission a corporate obsession we're going to make it really easy. So let's, let's take a minute and let's just see where we are as we examine our faith. And we look at it, and, and this is what we see a lot in the world. We see a lot in the church, I should say. We see a lot of people that, well, I really like the message. It, it sounds right. Or I, I go to this church because I just really like the way the preacher preaches. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but here's the reality. We're supposed to be here on mission and because of the mission. So then the person that's up here speaking doesn't matter. That's why we do things the way we do at Rockfish Church. Uh, I was here, not last week, but the three weeks before that. And that's one of the few times in seven years that I've been at Rockfish Church that I can remember the same person speaking at the same location three weeks in a row. We just typically don't do that because it's not about the person sitting here. Our goal, remember our mission statement, to make, equip, and release fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. Our, Our job up here is to equip the saints for the working of the ministry. So it's not about me. It's not about Pastor Tony. It's not about Mark or Keith or Eric or Dan or whoever else might come on this platform. But we we like the message. It tickles our ears. It doesn't make us uncomfortable. I was, I was reminded, I was listening to one of the radio stations, the Christian radio stations, and they were having their, their big fundraiser event that they do twice a year. And one of the testimonies that was called in is, I love listening to your radio station because I'm always encouraged and I never feel convicted. <laughs> Guys, if we never feel convicted, there's a real big problem. And that applies to me. Pastor Tony would tell you that applies to him just as well. If we never feel that conviction, if we, oh, I just love the, when, when, when so-and-so speaks because it's just always so encouraging. And Well, if we never feel that conviction, we're missing the point of it all. I accept it as true. Well... We, we, it sounds good, it sounds right, so I'm going to accept that as, as true. Doesn't mean we accept it as the truth. See, we'll accept a lot of things as true, and then we'll walk out the door, and we, we accepted it as it was true, but then we don't go out and act like it was truth. That's why there's a distinction there between true and truth. I believe it is truth. That's great, not that the truth really is dependent on whether we believe it or not right? But we we take that next step. I believe it is truth. These next two kind of got out of order. I speak, I'm going to skip down to, I speak of it as truth. So I I got this great truth that that I learned in in, in church or, or not even in church, guys. I learned it when I was at home and I was reading this, right? Because we don't always have to be in the church setting to get truth. Maybe I heard something on the radio and it rang as truth because it lined up with the word of God. So we speak, we were excited about it. Oh, you're not going to believe, I never will forget, I had teenagers, okay, we we had five kids, right? So I've, I've had plenty of teenagers come through my house. And they would get a hold of something. And they would come home from a youth meeting and they were so excited about this truth they, they just got a hold of. They couldn't wait to share with mom and dad this new truth. 
Now, that was on Wednesday night or Friday night or, or Sunday night, whenever the youth meeting was. But then by Tuesday, it was kind of gone. You're like, wait a second, what happened? You were just excited about this truth you learned on Sunday, but now it's Tuesday and you act like you never heard it before. And then there's, I live like it's truth. Does the truth make a difference in our daily lives? Do I, do I align myself with the truth or do I try to adjust the truth to fit my comfort? Now, I selectively pick and choose at the bottom because we have to remember it's either all true or how do we know any of it's true? I'm, I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. That's just the way it is. We cannot selectively pick and choose. And unfortunately, in the, the church, the capital C church around the world today, we see a lot of people that they want to pick and choose. I said it Wednesday night. I don't know if I said it the last time I was here, but I was reading a book, and I ran across a quote from a pastor that said, to be a Christ follower, you don't necessarily have to believe that everything in the Bible is true. Okay, that's one man's opinion. My question for anybody that holds that position is then how do you determine what is true and what is not? Because my Bible, I've never had one that came with a guide that told me how to discern what was true and what wasn't. So that's kind of the, the next thing we need to look at as we're examining where we stand is we need to examine some of our identifiers. And we look at the, the, the history of, of the Jewish people, and we're going to start there and then draw some parallels. Um, and this is interesting that, that this came up because my wife and I have the privilege of being friends with a rabbi and his wife. And so we've, we've really kind of, we've, and we're good enough friends with them that we can ask questions because some things just don't add up to us. We look at things differently. So when you talk about people that identify as Jewish, typically there's the, the people that identify as Jewish because they were born in Israel. They're citizens of Israel, so that makes them Jewish. Or it's a people, a race, or a people, they're descendants of the Israelites. They can trace their ancestry all the way back to this tribe or that tribe, and that's what makes them Jewish. There are cultural Jews, meaning they practice all the traditions, they have all the high holy days. We call them holidays. They call them high holy days. They go through the motions. They don't necessarily adhere to the Jewish faith. Meaning, I'm, I go and I, it, it would be the equivalent of showing up at church on Easter and Christmas. And that's it. We, we celebrate the traditions. And then there are those that actually carry the Jewish faith. They actually live out what they believe what, and what the Old Testament teaches to the best of their ability. And they carry the Jewish faith. And it's interesting because the more we get to interact with the Jewish community because we have a... Um, one of our sons is, is dating a girl that is Jewish. The more we learn these different things about the Jewish culture and how they you can identify as Jewish but not have anything to do with the, the, the faith. And so we look at us today, you know, especially in America, there are a lot of people, I mean, we've talked about America as a, as a Christian nation. America was cra founded on biblical principles, on Christian things like that. So it's just almost like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Now, it's not so much nowadays because it's getting harder and harder for people to want to identify as that. But we, we, we identify as, I'm an American first. Or we ad identify as, I'm a fill-in-the-blank. We, we put our ethnic identity above the fact that we're a citizen of the kingdom of God. We're, we're cultural in that we practice Christian traditions. We may go to church on Easter and, and um, Christmas, or I've been in some churches where the first Sunday of the month, attendance is going to be about triple what it is any other Sunday of the month because that's when you show up and pay your church dues. We, we call them tithes. They call them church dues. 
and you paid them on the first of the first Sunday of the month, but then you showed up and paid your church dues and you didn't have to come back for the rest of the month. And then there are those that identify as Christians that truly practice the faith within the American cultural context. Our faith here looks very different than the believers in China, for example. Our church looks very different here than the, than the church in Iran. And that could change. But the mission will never change just because our situation changes. So now we hit that fun part where we're going to go through a few things we have to stop doing if we're going to stay on mission and accomplish what God has called us to do. First thing we have to stop doing is getting offended. Guys, our world loves to be offended about everything now. Yesterday in Rayford was the Hope County Fall Festival. If you've been here long enough, you remember that used to be the Turkey Festival, right? And, and we changed it because of some craziness. You know, we have now where people get offended. Now the common thing is, is you're a really good person if you get offended on behalf of other people. Okay, we don't have time for that. Okay, Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. We've been lucky. We have lived in a, a, a sheltered home, so to speak. In, in the United States of America. We haven't had to face some of the things that our brothers and sisters around the world, even, even on the North American continent, have had to face in the past few years. We can't get offended by every little thing. And, and it amazes me, and maybe somebody here can explain it to me afterwards. I'd, I'd love for you to. How people have the, the margin, the the, the margin in their time, the margin in their emotions, the margin in their energy, to get offended by what somebody said, somebody from Hollywood, or somebody said something on the internet, and now they're, they're ready to go to war because they're so offended. I don't have time for it. I, chances are I probably don't even know who it is that said it, so why do I care? Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense and discretion make a man slow to anger, and it is his honor and glory to overlook a transgression or offense without seeking revenge or harboring resentment. So we have to be real careful because sometimes we'll say, I'm going to let that offense go. I'm just going to let it go. But we don't. We hang on to it, and we remember it. We, we need to overlook offenses. I w this, this happened to me at the Rayford campus three or four years ago, I showed up on a Wednesday night. I was, I had something, someone I needed to meet with. I needed to have a very important conversation with this person. And that's kind of my mindset. I was on mission. And when I get on mission like that, I, I will walk right by people and not even, even see them. And we had a lady that was at the door and she happened to, to, to look differently than I did. And she got offended because I walked right by her and didn't speak. Because when I walked, when I got to the door, I immediate saw, immediately saw the person standing right over there that I needed to have this very important conversation with. And I walked by. And she got, she got I mean, real, like went to the, Pastor Tony about this because I had so offended her. Guys, we're supposed to assume the best of others. So if, if I come in and, and Kevin doesn't stop and speak to me, well, then I'm supposed to believe that that means Kevin had something else on his mind that was more important than me in that moment. And I think that's where we get messed up. We show up and we think we're the most important thing going on. And we get offended when other people don't respond like we're as important to them as we feel like we are to ourselves. We got to stop getting offended. This one, we've got to stop making excuses. I'm talking about specifically for sin, which also means we have to stop accepting excuses for sin. Sin is sin. We've seen it. We've seen a progression in our, in our country. There was a big push to convince people that, uh, well, I, I was just born this way. 
it becomes an excuse because if I was born this way, then I'm not responsible for my actions, right? Y'all quiet today. I know this is not, a, I'm sorry, this, I'm, I'm not sorry. This is not a fun, encouraging message. This is just the reality of what we're going to have to do if we're going to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ before the time runs out on the clock. Because the time is going to run out on the clock. Either it's going to run out on my clock and your clock, or it's going to run out on the clock for the whole thing. But when it does, that's it. Yes, it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That does not mean everybody's going to go to heaven. You get your chance to make that choice. And once, you've, once the time runs out, you've got to live with the results of your choice. So we've got to stop accepting excuses. We've got to stop making excuses for our own sin. Well, everybody does it. I mean, we, we get that, wow, you know, well, I was just trying to keep up with the flow of traffic. Guys, we are good at making excuses. Remember, the easiest person in the world for me to lie to is me. Same for you. We can convince ourselves of anything if we want to. You, you would be amazed. I have, I have heard men try to convince me that it was God's will that they left their wife for this other woman. I have seen women get on Facebook and post about how, how thankful they are that God brought this man into their life. Meanwhile, this man is still married and is not taking care of his wife and his kids. We can convince ourselves of anything we want. We've got to stop. We've got to stop apologizing. This is a big one because people love to throw accusations at the church. Anybody familiar with Westboro Baptist Church? Yep, Westboro Baptist Church did some, some what I consider horrible things. I don't see any way in the scripture you can justify what they did. But I'm not going to apologize for Westboro Baptist Church because I'm not a part of Westboro Baptist Church. I can't do anything about what they're doing. I can't apologize for the church of the past when the church did not stand up in America at the very beginning and say slavery is wrong. I can't do anything about that. I, that's not me. I wasn't a part of that. Okay? Us trying to carry the consequences of what the church did in the past, it came to me this morning, that's equivalent to the city fining you because your neighbor didn't mow his yard. That's, you getting that bill for that fine and paying, it's not going to convince your neighbor to mow his yard, is it? It's the same thing. We, we can't apologize for what we don't have the ability to change. We can't change the past. It is what it is. And we can't go to God with these words. It's not our job to mediate between God and man. Jesus does that. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. It's not our job to carry the accusations of the world against the church to God either and say, God, what do I do about this? Okay. We can pray for the people of Westboro Baptist Church because here's the thing. They honestly believe they're do what they're doing is right or they wouldn't be doing it. But we can't, we can't become... That, that mediator that, that makes everything okay for people's offenses or problems with another church. I've been in churches, I've been hurt bad by churches before. But Pastor Tony wasn't the pastor of that church. And Mark wasn't an elder of that church. And Keith wasn't, and Wayne weren't deacons of that church. So I can't come in here with a chip on my shoulder towards Pastor Tony and Mark and you know, the, the deacons of the church because I was hurt by the elders and deacons of another church. Right? We can't let people hold us responsible for other people's actions. We've got to stop avoiding a stance or taking a stance. Time after time after time, we see people who have attained success get asked a question and it usually involves one of the hot button topics of the, 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 the culture today. They're asked, is, is homosexuality sin? 
and they'll, they'll avoid taking a stance one way or the other. Is, is abortion wrong? They'll avoid taking a stance. They'll give you an answer like, well, you know, I just, I wouldn't ever have one and wouldn't ever want a loved one of mine to have one, but who am I to tell somebody else what's right or wrong for them? Guys, we have to take a stand, and we have to take a strong stand. Sin is sin, and it has no place in the church. And then this one, this one's the other side of it we have to be careful of. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You wouldn't watch your child running out in the middle of a busy street and keep quiet because, oh, they're just, they're just trying to live their life. Right? You would do everything you could to stop them. We, we are watching literally millions upon millions of people waste their life and face eternity in hell. What are we doing about it? We're afraid to take a stance. We're, we're, we're afraid that it may cost us our job or... Even worse, it may cost us some followers on TikTok or friends on Facebook because we're not willing to take a stand and say this is wrong and it shouldn't be this way. Now, we have to make sure if we're, if we're taking a stand, we're taking the right stance. So we avoid taking a wrong stance. I've seen pastors stand up and defend a woman's right to choose. I, I don't get it. We all have the right to choose, that's right, but we also know that actions have consequences, right? And, and we're all adults here, so we, we know what actions it are that lead to a pregnancy. That was a choice. And I know, I know, I know, what about, what about the case of rape and incest? You're talking about less than 1% of all abortions in the United States. We don't make the rule for the exception. You know, and, and people always want to throw that less than 1% up as the justification for the other 99%. And it just doesn't work. We have to take a strong stance and we have to take the, the right stance. And, you know, we talked about last week that, that why Jesus left the 99 to go find the one. Be careful that the world doesn't, um, you don't buy into this. Well, we're, we're looking at the greater good. Because common sense would say if, we, if Jesus was looking at the greater good, he would have stayed with and taken care of the 99, and that one would have just, whatever happened, happened. That's not how Jesus did us. It can't be how we do the world. We've got to stop critiquing and criticizing others. Okay? It's not... My job to tear the church down. There are whole YouTube channels, there are radio programs that they're dedicated to telling us what everybody else is doing wrong. Basically, get in the fight or get out of the way. If you're not doing it, we love when people come to us at Rockfish Church and say, hey, the church should be doing this. Great. Put a plan together and tell us how you're going to do it and we'll support you. You know, don't, don't, and, and if you're not ready for that response, I, I, I promise you you're not ready to come to a leader at Rockfish Church and say, hey, the church should be doing this. Because if God's put that on your heart, then God's calling you to lead it. God's not going to tell me what your role is. He's not going to tell me what he's called you to do, and I'm the messenger. He's going to call you. Stop focusing on your rights. Oh, we could camp out here for a long time because this is a uniquely American phenomenon here. We're focused on our rights. My mission is not dependent on my rights. And how many times have we seen the church fighting for their rights all the while people are dying and going straight to hell? And we're too busy fighting for our right to peaceably assemble or our right to bear arms or our right to free speech. Not that those aren't important and there's a place for standing up for those rights. But if we're coming off of mission to focus on those rights, we're in trouble. Another way to look at it is this. 
I'm just going to focus on the green. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. In other words, you don't really have any rights. You don't belong to you. You belong to somebody else. Now, we're going to go quickly through these things we need to start doing. We start taking ownership. See, guys, we are all a part of Rockfish Church. We are all responsible for playing our part at Rockfish Church. That's it. I'm not responsible for the church down the street. I'm not responsible for the church I was at before I came to Rockfish Church. We're responsible for where we are now. We need to focus on the small church. What I mean by that is we need to be faithful in the little things. Men, we need to start at home. Okay? We are called to disciple, to make disciples. We can't, we can't, what good does it do if we win the world but our children don't know Jesus? He who is faithful in very little in a very little thing is also faithful in much, and he who is dishonest in a very little thing is also dishonest in much. There's a reason that in the scriptures, when it lays out the qualifications for elders and deacons and pastors and, and, and all of those, your family, your household must be managed well. There's a reason that's in there. Because if you can't manage your house with your, your, you and your spouse and your two kids... Then how, and you can't manage your you know, $50,000 a year income, how are you going to manage a church with 100 people and $150,000, $300,000 a year? See, it, it, there's a reason for that. We've got to start focusing where we are. What can I do right now? And, and I'm standing here today as, as a testament to how that works. See, when we first came to Rockfish Church, I started serving in the kitchen. Flipping burgers. We, we worked in the nursery. I got the, the, the crying baby and I went into the, the, the room where it was kind of a little darker and I got the baby to sleep and I went to sleep. But I showed up and I did what I could. And, and those little things, they lead to. We're, we're very big on that. Nobody that's here in a position as an elder or a deacon just walked in and got that position. They had to be proven over time. I flipped burgers for years before. I, we've been at Rockfish Church seven going on eight years. I've been able to stand on the platform for just about two. Okay, I flipped burgers for a long time and I have no problem flipping burgers. I'll flip burgers today. Because I love to serve. But that's how we have to be faithful in the little. So don't get hung up on, well, God's called me to do this, and so I'm not going to serve anywhere in the church until I can do this. That's not how it works. Restoring the family. The family is under attack in modern culture. And we have to be careful because we need to... Part of restoring the family, I think we have to be careful what organizations and movements we get behind. We need to look at what they really stand for. There were, there were Christians, there were churches, there were people that I believe honestly in their heart they meant well. And they got behind, and I'm going to be very controversial here, and, and, and oh well, I don't apologize for it. They got behind an organization called Black Lives Matter. Now if you've studied that organization and the founders' beliefs, one of their core values is the destruction of the nuclear family. I don't care what, what good how good your intentions are, if one of your core goals is the destruction of the nuclear family, I can't get behind that because God ordained the family. It was God's original system. See, the, the original government was the family. So we, we, we've got to stay focused on, and guys, that starts with our own family. We have to get our own house right before we can tell others how to get their house right. It means we have to, our relationships with our kids have to be right. I can't tell you how many times I've had to call and apologize to one of my sons, just one of them, because he knows how to push my buttons and he knows how to make dad mad. Yeah. And, then, and then he leaves and, I mean, usually doesn't get but, you know, out, out of the neighborhood before I'm just so convicted and I know I've got to call him and apologize. Even if what I was saying was right, when I said it in anger, I was wrong. 
We've got to start leading by example, not words. Do as I say, not as I do does not work anymore. It never really worked to begin with. Even Paul recognized this when he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. See, people should be able to follow us because we're following Christ. They should be able to see. We've all heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words. Well, that's truth, and we need to live like it's truth and not like we can, again, do as I say, not as I do. Start, so we need to start leaving it better than you found it. See, guys, Rockfish Church should be better because you're here. Your job, the place you work, should be better off because you're there. As Christ followers, we should be the best employees. We should be, it doesn't matter where we go, we should leave it better than we found it. That cashier at Walmart ought to be more encouraged when you walk away than she was when you walked up. That car salesman that you didn't buy the car from still ought to feel better about things when you leave than they did when you showed up. We've got to start leaving everywhere we are, where darkness meets light. When light shows up, the darkness has to scatter. We should live like that. So when I walk in, things should have to be better. Somebody needs to be encouraged. Somebody needs Jesus. We all need Jesus, but somebody needs to meet Jesus, right? There's always a way we can bring value to whatever, whether it's an organization or an individual. You go into someone's home, it should be better because you were there. Because, see, we got this idea of church. Church is this thing we go to. No, I'm the church. You're the church. The kingdom of God goes wherever we go. Guys, we've got to fulfill our responsibilities. This is, this is I closed Wednesday night at, at Rayford with, with this quote. The great commandment, you know, the, the, it says it's a great commandment. You know, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment and the great commission, we've talked about the great commission, going to all the world making disciples, baptizing them and teaching them all that I've commanded. The great commandment and the great commission are not choices to be made. They're simply orders to be followed. It's not optional. We don't get to choose. When you decided to follow Christ... He says, if any man will come after me, you have to do three things. You have to deny yourself. It's, it's always interesting to me. He, he said that first. That means if, if you ask, can I be blank and a Christian? No. Because if you're not willing to deny yourself of whatever you put in that blank, you can't follow him. He said, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and you have to follow him. It's a very simple, it's a very simple formula. Stand if you're able. If you're here today and you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, please, please do not walk out this door without at least talking to myself or Mark or I would, I would dare say grab anybody with an orange sticker and say, hey, I need to know this Jesus he's talking about. I promise you, I promise you it doesn't matter what it costs you. Guys, I'm big on this. I think we've messed up because we've come across with this salvation is free. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. Yes, it's free to get, but it will cost you something. I finally got it. It's free in the same sense as if I go out and I decide to give you a brand new car today. That car was free to you, right? But for it to be any good or of any use to you at all, it's going to cost you something. That's the way salvation is, but I promise you, you'll never give up more than you gain. For those of us that are here and we know Jesus Christ and we're following Jesus Christ, the challenge is simple. Go therefore and make disciples. That's what we're called to do. That's the whole focus of this. That's where we are. Because see, we enjoy our freedom right now to do so. It's never going to be easier to make disciples than it is right now from a freedom standpoint. It will only get harder but our responsibility doesn't change based on the freedoms we're afforded by the government, based on the freedoms we're afforded by our workplace. 
Father God, we come to you right now, God. We thank you for, 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 for taking this time with us today, God. God, we thank you for giving us a burden to reach the lost, God. God, as we're surrounded on all sides by people who are blindly following a path that leads to nothing but destruction. God, open our eyes to see those around us as you see them, God, to recognize the seriousness of the situation. God, give us boldness to speak up, to speak into those lives. God, help us to see everywhere we go how we can leave it better than when we found it. God, guide and direct us as we go through this week. Give us opportunities to share your love with someone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.